on the one hand, there is an established trajectory of dogmatic indoctrination and ideolo ideological capture. How do we get ourselves into this illiberal path? And on the other hand, we're seeing a growing movement of resistance and pushback. Can we be successful? Joining me for this panel are really distinguished authors and scholars. Um, professor Gail Harriet is a law professor at the University of San Diego, where she teaches civil rights law and history, employment, discrimination, legislation, remedies, and courts. She's also a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights uh, and chairman of the board of the American Civil Rights Project. She's also a member of the board of the National Association of <coughs> Scholars, a board member and executive vice president of our organization, Californians for Equal Rights Foundation, and the chair emeritus of the Civil Rights Practice School at the, Federal, at the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy. Professor Joe Nelvin studied philosophy at Columbia College, anthropology at UC San Diego, and law at the University of San Diego. He served as the associate director of the Institute for Regional Studies of the Californias and the Institute of Chicano Urban Affairs. Joe will be talking today from several perspectives as a college instructor of lawyering, lawyering skills and courses in cultural anthropology. He has also taught about human nature, logic, peace, and justice, and indigenous religions. Ms. Chris Arendt here graduated German law school and passed the German first state bar exam in 1979, and then returned to California to study law at UC Berkeley, where he received a JD degree and passed the California bar exam in 1981. After a brief stint in New York City, Chris returned to Germany where he practiced law for over 20 years in a leading international law firm. He retired from the practice of law and returned to California to settle on the Central Coast in 2005. He was elected in 2018 to the school board of the Paso Robles Joint Unified School District, which was one of the first school, board, school districts in California to ban race uh, divisive concepts or commonly known as critical race theory. He is currently serving as president of that board. So let me direct the, ask Gail the first question. Why is the education establishment so bought into the idea of judging individuals by their race and, uh, and the idea of instituting uneducational and non-scientific programs of thought indoctrination? Who raised that up for a long story? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I came to, to academia in 1989 as a law professor, um, and a lot of what you're hearing today about critical race theory, um, you'll hear teachers say, we're not teaching that in, in school, uh, we're not doing that. That's, that's an esoteric you know, area that, that law professors uh, write about. And yeah, I mean, it is. When I first came to the University of San Diego, uh, critical race theory was a fashionable thing that law professors did. And like most of us were sort of like, that's nice, you know, that's nice. You know, a few law professors were into this. And, and they were becoming somewhat famous for it, but like it, it wasn't it wasn't what most law professors did. And we kind of figured, you know, and we not just figured, we thought and we said, this will never get out of the academy. Absolutely never. But lo and behold, you know, now it is. Now it's everywhere. Um, and no, they're not teaching exactly what the law professors uh, were writing about in the late 1980s. Uh, they're, they're, they're teaching in fourth grade classes, uh, something that is sort of the fourth grade version of that. Uh, what was written about back in the 1980s was more sophisticated, but I don't think any, any more right. I think it was you know, very silly at the time, um, and it's very silly now. But that's important to know. Things spread. Um, so at the time I was starting in school and starting to teach, uh, we were seeing critical race theory. Every law professor knew about it. It was fashionable. Uh, race preferential um, admissions policies had at that point been around for you know 20 years, even a little bit more than 20 years um, since, since Lance Hawke's book 
Mine too. Uh, do you guys expediency how race preferences damage higher education? And the point I want to make is all of this is related. Uh, critical race theory would not have emerged in law schools in the 1980s had it not been for the fact that race preferential admissions had emerged in the late 60s. Uh, and they kind of, it emerged in kind of two parts, and sort of interestingly, I think, uh, because the very, very early um, race preferential admissions policies um, were reaching out um, to mainly African American, but also Latino students who were not middle class, were not upper middle class, as they you know, sometimes are today. They were actually looking for, for students um, who were from very disadvantaged um, backgrounds, very disadvantaged. Um, and it was thought, I think naively at the time, that as soon as you give these, these, these young, young, young people a chance, they are going to rise to the occasion and everything's going to be great. It's, and that is going to be take no time at all. By 1972, we'll have this licked. Uh, and of course, that was never true. And they went so far. They were getting large sums of money um, from, from foundations, particularly the Rockefeller Foundation, for doing things like going into the prisons and finding um, young men who had been gang leaders and said, these young men have displayed leadership skills. We'll bring them to UCLA. Um, and it would be great. I mean, it was, it was very naive. Weirdly, it was very assimilationist, too. They thought that, like, you know, we're going to take young people, uh, and we're not only going to put them into college classes, but we'll take them to the opera, we'll take them to the museums, and pretty soon, you know, everything's going to be just hunky-dory, um, and they won't be any call at all. But it takes more time than that. You, know, you have students um, that have been brought up, you know, in families that are, that are broken. Uh, they have been very disadvantaged. Their schooling from K through 12 uh, has not been great. You're not going to fix that. Uh, by suddenly putting them in a classroom. And what happened at UCLA and at Cornell was actual violence. I mean, the, the gun battles broke out. You know, these were students that, that were um, you know, from very disadvantaged backgrounds and had been engaged in criminal behavior in the past. Um, and it was, it was very seriously mistaken. Uh, it just did not work at all. And from about then, they turned around and said, well, no, 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 what we're going to do from now on, we don't, we don't care about class background anymore. If, if, the, if the student um, you know, is African American or Latino um, and has as, you know, as good an academic credentials as we could get, um, if it happens to be somebody who's from a very advantaged background, that's fine. We're just going to go on with that. Um, and you know, that also, for reasons that, that Rick Sanders was talking about, uh, you know, has not worked out the way we thought it would. Uh, very, I think, well-meaning people thought that this was going to jumpstart you know, high-status careers for a lot of African Americans and Latinos, and this was going to work out very well. But weirdly, it does just the opposite. Uh, if we had not started down this road, um, and you know, by the time we're taking it from that approach rather than the original, let's go into the prisons and find, find you know, gang leaders. By the time they started that approach, um, you know, early 70s, instead of producing more African American physicians, more African American engineers, more African American uh, lawyers and such, you know, it was it, it, it was working out the other way. The people were sort of deeply committed to this. Um, and so by the 1980s, with the rise of, of, of critical legal theory, part of it was sort of looking back on the last 10 years, the last 15 years, and saying, you know, it's not working. Why? It must be because of racism. Instead of actually targeting the right reason, we're putting students in situations where it's difficult for them to compete, where if we put them just a little bit, you know, a little bit lower in the pecking order um, in terms of colleges and universities, and a lot of these students are going to graduate, they're going to go on to medical school, they're going to go on to law school, they're going to, be, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to do well, they're going to learn that they can compete. And instead, we put them often in the only schools on the planet um, where they would have difficulty competing. I mean, MIT, uh, I, there may be some MIT grads in, in the audience right now, but you know, these people are generally, you know, they're rocket scientists, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, that's, they're smart. They're really, really, you know, they're, they do really well. Um, and often they've been living and breathing science and engineering since they were babies. Um, and we would put extremely talented minority students who were very good, had great scores, could have succeeded in any, in any school and on the planet. Uh, but instead, they were sent to the one place where they end up as, as you know, communications uh, majors. And, there's nothing wrong with being a communications major, but that wasn't their dream, and that wasn't where their best talents uh, were. 
Um, so you get this connection between race preferential admissions and the rise of ideologies that are meant to, to cover over the fact that those race preferential admissions were not producing uh, the results that we were hoping for. Um, and all of that gets, gets you know, blown in together. Um, and then something happened in 1991. It's extremely important. Uh, didn't happen to, to academia so much. Uh, President George H.W. Bush signs in the Civil Rights Act of 1991, which for the first time makes it potentially financial, financially lucrative for a person suing for race harassment or sexual harassment um, to bring that action because for the first time they can get damages for emotional distress, for the first time they can get damages for, for punitive damages. Before that, all you could do was get lost wages if you, you were suing under Title VII. And suddenly, things take off. They take off big time. Um, and corporations um, start being really, really worried about whether or not they are going to be held liable for any kind of sexual or racial harassment. Uh, Congress meant well. They were trying to do something that would be helpful. Uh, but it turns out, because harassment was defined so vaguely, so very vaguely, and because the standard is cumulative, so if you're an employer or you're a university, uh, you don't want to just prevent people from being harassed. You want to prevent anybody from saying anything, anything, no matter how small. <laughs> Miss Snodgrass, you look nice today. No, you can't do that. Um, and so, you know, it's cumulative. So they, they want to have, they want to tell people, don't, 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 don't start talking about it. Don't say anything. Don't say anything bad about affirmative action. So, you know, when I started here, um, universities tended to be really committed to raise preferential admissions. Um, and that's not new. That is not new at all. But it was easier to say, you know, I'm not sold on this idea. I think it's a bad idea. Uh, these days, it's very, very difficult to even speak up about it. Um, so that's a big difference um, in how these things. So that's my basic point I wanted to make, uh, was that all these things are, are connected. Um, all these things are connected, and I'll talk more about it in my next question. All right. So it trickles down from higher education. And, uh, and it trickles down from higher education to K-12. And we're seeing it at mass scale now. Uh, not only in California. So my next question is for Chris. What have you and your colleagues at the Paso Robles School Board done to push back? Well, the real simple answer is that in August 2021, we adopted as one of the first school boards in the nation a resolution that banned critical race theory from our schools. A little bit more of a story to that, if I can give you a little bit of backstory on it. First of all, back in, I was very irritated in the summer of 2020 after all the George Floyd rioting and all the screaming about systemic racism. And so I decided I got to address this topic. I wrote an article that got me in a lot of trouble called The Myth of Systemic Racism. You go online, you Google that, The Myth of Systemic Racism, my last name, it'll pop up. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, this issue, the whole issue of race was going on very much at the time. By about uh, December, January, around the turn of the year, beginning of 2021, all school districts in the state were passing anti-racism resolutions. The word anti-racism, of course, uh, now marked by Kendi, who sort of claimed that word for himself and warped it. Uh, it's a common tactic of the left. Take a decent word, equity, diversity, whatever it is, and then bastardize the meaning of the word. Well, uh, they, our administration did a copy and paste, sent that resolution, presented to us as something that uh, they thought would make our local diversity committee and past nobles happy. I looked, took one look and I said, hell no. And uh, I decided we will write a different resolution. This is based on what I believe is the, really the ideological conflict of our time. The ideological conflict is between this critical race theory, this dialectic approach to analyzing society along racial lines, and uh, what I like to call the Martin Luther King approach, equality before the law, that our resolution became a resolution condemning racism, 
And it started off with Martin Luther King's famous quote about uh, judging people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Uh, yes, I got called racist for that one, too. I've been called racist a lot. Uh, we then got into the uh, issue a little bit later of ethnic studies. I was very strongly in support of our ethnic studies course with a couple of conditions. No CRT, no hindsight bias. In other words, treating it as a constructive ethnic studies course, a history course that trials and tribulations of all the ethnic groups that have made up the country and turned it into the melting pot, a phrase that also gets me called racist. Uh, it's a sort of a standard refrain. You're a racist, you're a racist. Well, Uh, and then, then that brought us to the resolution uh, getting rid of the CRT a couple months later. We approved that ethnic studies course. The Alliance for Constructive Ethnic Studies has been very, uh, given us a lot of praise for that course. And we did it, one reason aside from the fact that students were asking for an ethnic studies course, we did it to provide a model of how other districts can do it because you no longer, now that they've made it our CR, this ethnic studies curriculum, uh, they made it kind of fuzzy at the state level, and I read all 839 pages of that damn thing. Oh it was a, a horrid task, but <laughs> it's so filled with gobbledygook and educational leads. We have legal leads, they have educational leads. But uh, it's fuzzy enough that you can fit a constructive ethnic studies course, in other words, a history course, within that framework, and uh, we even did it so we got AP credit from our local junior college for the course. Uh, one thing I knew when adop adopting a resolution for critical, uh, banning critical race theory, you've got to know what you're talking about. It's amazing how many people really don't understand the philosophical foundations of critical race theory. I've studied it quite a bit, especially reading the book with the creative title. Critical Race Theory and Introduction by Delgado and Stefancic. Uh, and, uh, they, uh, and yes, I'm, I knew and know what I'm talking about. I went through and to ban critical race theory, you don't do just a flat ban. You have to take the individual teaching points, the individual foundations, the individual te main teachings of critical race theory, and you strike those out of your curriculum so that teachers can no longer uh, say that one race is morally inherently better than the other race because of whatever they've come out with. It's, it's, uh, by the way, I'd be glad to provide a copy of that resolution to anybody here. Uh, if you, you've all got those little notebooks there. You might jot down my email address, and then I will send you a whole bunch of material. You'll, you'll want to throw most of it away, but it's email, so you can delete it all. Uh, the email address is Chris. C-H-R-I-S, at Aaron Law, A-R-E-N-D-L-A-W, one word, dot com. So Chris at AaronLaw.com. So if you'd like to have that material on CRT, and I'll send you a whole bunch of stuff. One of the things I saw that uh, you mentioned by how did this CRT stuff get really started spread through academia. When I was doing my research, I found one law review article that was critical of critical race theory. This was back in 1998. I Google as a research tool. I spoke with the professor. He had submitted the law review article to over 60 publications, 60 law reviews. One from a smaller university published it. People were already getting nervous at that time, scared about uh, challenging critical race theory. You could be called a racist. It could have an adverse impact on your career. And now that is definitely the case. And it is the fact that they first said, okay, it's just Professor Derek Bell and his few acolytes playing in their sandbox to let him play. And then it got a little bit more, but that's really, that's, that's just those prof couple professors over there in the corner. They're not, it doesn't bother me with my teaching property law or whatever it is. And the thing grew and grew and it festered. And anyone who tried to oppose it, 
would be shut down, called racist, and oh my goodness, if you're branded as a racist, especially in academia, you're dead. Your career is over. So uh, uh, it grew and grew, and now we've got the mess we've got. Fortunately, I look out there and I see we've got a nice group here, a pretty good-sized group, especially this good size earlier. The first CRT convention was held in 1989 with about 90 people who gathered, I think, Minnesota or something like that. Wisconsin. Or Wisconsin. 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 Close enough. Close enough. And they, uh, uh, we had more than that group of people here today at our basically first anti-CRT conference probably in the country. It's a good start, but it takes moving on, moving on, and having kind of backbones. And you've got to be willing to put up with insults and threats. And at times it helps to display a little bit of aggression on your own part when you're uh, uh, challenged. Thank you. Thank you for your time. This reminds me of a conversation I recently had with um, federal judge James Hall about moral courage. He was addressing a group of uh, law school students about fighting and standing up for equal treatment, for the Constitution, for free speech. And he said, if you cannot be the first, at least be the second. If you cannot be the second, at least be the third. But don't be silent. CRT uh, accuse us of being sad faced actors that don't want our children, or American children, to learn about race. Proponents of liberated ethnic studies say that we don't want uh, schools to teach about history and cultures. So, Joe, uh, my next question is for you. How can history and cultures be taught with balance and nuance? Uh, is there more to be done at different levels? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that we enter this, this discussion at different points in time, different threads. Uh, I began to uh, understand this back when I began as an anthropologist in the early 1970s. And, if, uh, and I hadn't really realized that there was a revolution or rebellion going up at uh, UC Berkeley and San Francisco State by faculty wanting to have ethnic studies taught in the university. So that goes be earlier than, say, CRT theory. This is the engine that's really driving uh, a lot of this kind of revolutionary fervor that goes back into the 60s with, say, the rebel priest Camilo Torres, and the wars, and et cetera, that, that kind of ferment going on within the United States. The Department of Anthropology at UCSD was not interested in teaching ethnic studies. However, the <coughs> campus was growing. Uh, we had a third college, which is now called Thurgood Marshall College. And so uh, they were <coughs> obligated to send a sacrificial lamb, myself, over to third college to be a TA, a teaching assistant in a class on black psychology. So I went there, and I was the only white person in the class. And the student, one of the students raised his hand and said, is he going to grade our papers? <laughs> so the professor, quite diplomatically, said, no, he's here to learn also. So, which was good for me, because I got to sit and not have to worry about doing any work and learn. <laughs> and I think that's some of the things that I've continued with me in terms of now how, when the wheel turns and I now teach these materials, say an introductory class of cultural anthropology, and we teach about different identities, race like, and ethnicity, sex and gender, uh, vocation, uh, kinship, clan. Um, how do we begin that, discuss, uh, this, that study without forgetting that there are multiple parts to this argument in terms of how we fix society? We don't have a perfect society. It needs to be fixed in some way. But what are the problems and what are the fixes? So uh, I developed an approach called a, a two paradigms approach, or two lenses. If you listen to people who talk within the framework of critical race theory or culturally responsive teaching or the many other terms that are used with critical in there, they talk about having a critical lens. Um, 
what I look at is there's critical thinking and then there's critical thinking plus. Okay, critical thinking is a systematic approach. You look at all the different uh, 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 various theories to explain what you're talking about. Uh, I say it's a disparity that you observe in society. The other uh, approach takes critical thinking and adds an overlay of this critical lens. Oppress oppressive, marginalized groups, uh, race consciousness. So you don't begin with an open-ended discussion of what is critical thinking. So let me give you an example of how this would work and how I would recommend, uh, rather than say banning critical race theory, which I understand and I teach at a college level, and uh, uh, we do play a little bit more hardball at the college level if they let us. Um, so let's look at the book uh, Cast by Isabel Wilkinson. So her book is very persuasive as a memoir. It's a subjective narrative, which is a favorite approach of a critical lens approach, looking at the personal experience of someone who has been marginalized in our society. Uh, then she gets into, in terms of her premise of the United States being a caste society, one of the things that features of that is laws against uh, uh, intergroup, interracial marriage. Uh, and she correctly notes there are 41 states that had uh, laws against, uh, an that were anti-miscegenation, interracial marriage laws. That's fine. That's the critical a lens or critical race theory approach of pointing to a problem in our society. She does not say all of those laws were thrown out in 1967. What about that? That's what you go to your point of no teaching from a historical deficit perspective. You've got to complete the analysis. So if you recognize that those laws are gone, she might, I imagine, uh, as the locals would say, yes, but racial prejudice continued. Well, let's look at the Gallup polls at that time. Gallup polls uh, showed in the 1950s that there was about a 4% approval of interracial marriage, which was consistent with those laws. But today, over 90% of the United States favor or is positive towards interracial marriage. So the Attitudes have dramatically changed along with the, the eradication of those laws. In addition, there has been an increase, actually, increase in the behavior of, of, of our population of interracial marriages. Also, in terms of the U.S. Census, uh, they allow the um, claiming of, of multiracial identities. So we have changed substantially over the last 50 years. That's what's missing. That's the critical thinking part. That's not in Isabel Wilkinson's book. And that approach, those uh, two different channels of approaching discussion or understanding for students is, is what needs to be incorporated and engaged with. Now, when I began to look at and make comments to the Power of Unified School District after having reviewed, as one of the many reviewers of the uh, California's uh, model ethnic studies curriculum, and then looking at how the Power Unified School District was developing its own approach, I was told by the head of the uh, curriculum committee, there's the right way, there's the wrong way, and there's the POW way. <laughs> and so I expected that they would be having a constructive melding of the different approaches. <laughs> Uh, and I sent them in uh, considerable comments to their draft materials. Um, and of course they were ignored. I've, I've also appeared before the, the Board of Trustees multiple times making basically the comment that it's fine to teach about marginalized communities, but you should do it with a dual paradigm approach. You have to complete the picture, otherwise you are creating cookie cutter, say, intellectual monsters as opposed to really creative thinkers. Isn't that what education is about? Again, uh, I've been ignored 
And this uh, then kind of continues the discussion with parents who are now noticing that, or have been noticing that, and uh, the question is how do you proceed forward with uh, adding this additional framework to students, a, a complete framework in terms of teaching ethnic studies. So uh, one of the questions that Wen Wan had asked me, uh, how can we promote the values of equality, liberty, and true diversity? I couldn't figure out what true diversity was, but that's kind of what is at the heart of the uh, issue that we're talking about in ethnic studies. If you look at the Constitution, um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are created, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we have equality, we have liberty, no mention of diversity. <laughs> That is not in the Constitution, so it can be a constitutional argument. And we know that our country has gone through lots of turmoil, civil war, the fight for uh, the women's suffrage rights, Jim Crow area. So all of those fights have been under the guise of equality to create. So our thrust towards diversity has been come through the engine of equality, not of there's a sense of fairness that does it, but the actual legal framework is, I would argue, equality and liberty. So if you're going to use that framework, I think that has an aspiration or a value framework for the students when they talk about ethnic studies and the history of the United States, incorporating a framework that is true to our Constitution, but is realistic in terms of the struggles that we've had to go through and is comprehensive in the analysis of what has been done in terms of actual social reforms over the last half century. So that's where I'm at at the present time. One thing, you, you hit a, a really important point. Critical thinking versus critical theory. You notice it's not called critical race thinking. Critical, <laughs> thinking. critical thinking is Socrates and logic and all that other fine stuff that we sort of uh, associate with rational, sane people. Critical theory is an ideology. It has a few basic assumptions and then from there it applies its deductive reasoning and all the other stuff that lead down. But those few basic assumptions, they are unquestioning. You cannot be unquestionable, you cannot challenge them if you do, you're a racist. It's that distinction. What, if you understand that distinction between critical thinking and critical theory as an ideology, it helps you a long way in understanding these issues. Good point. Earlier on this morning, my mentor and co author Lance mentioned the a uh, long march through the institutions as a lens to see how our institutions and our public life have been preoccupied today with this work ideology. And I've written a rebuttal on this thesis. I argue that there is a way, there are three ways to long march back through the institutions. So essentially there are three institutional routes. The first route is political. Uh, the radicals simply need to be the radicals simply need to be voted out, and the second route is uh, strategic or rational choice. We need to make work pay, make them pay through public pressure campaigns, through legal challenges, and number three, uh, I would argue, uh, is the most important route. It's cultural. Uh, not all ideas are equally good, and we need to be unapologetically promoting our more superior values. So my next question is um, to is about your thoughts on these routes. Which route do you think is the most viable? And let's start with Gail. I have a very firm opinion on this. We will get nowhere if we don't do all three at the same time. 
Uh, they absolutely have to be going together. Uh, we're not going to budge anything if we can't do all three at the same time. Uh, let's start with the political route. You know, vote the bums out. Yeah. <laughs> But it is not going to do us a speck of good because number one, first of all, they're going to have to fight, um, you know, the bureaucracy. If we're talking about a school board. The superintendent of schools is a full-time worker. There are teachers. There's a staff. They are pushing back in the other direction. It is not easy to change the world through the school board, but it's also we won't be able to do it unless we we can elect school boards. So we have got to go that route. But we got to accept that that is not going to be enough. Um, one thing, and for not just school boards, of course. City councils, uh, state legislatures, Congress, all of these things. One thing I hope anybody elected to, to any job where they control a budget, one of the things you really can do is like defund the radicals. But you know, if we don't win their hearts and minds, if we don't win in number three as well. Um, then eventually, uh, younger people who are like being educated into all of this stuff, they're going to be voting really soon, and they're going to vote the radicals back in. Uh, so we got it. We got to do both at the same time. Now, what when one calls strategic, I, I would like to break that, at least the law side of it, into two. Um, you know, there is taking advantage of the law as it is today. Uh, we had a speaker earlier who was talking about how difficult it was to find a lawyer to represent somebody in Nevada um, who was, had clearly been, been, been racially harassed under the laws that exist today. Uh, and we got we to be coming back. We got you know, to have a line of lawyers uh, who are willing to take advantage of what the law is today. But at the same time, uh, there are structural issues here built into the law. And if we, can, if we can't move those structural issues, um, we're not going to win in the end. Um, for example, on race preferential admissions, as I'm saying, that partly drives the ideology. It's because we've made it difficult uh, for underrepresented minority students <coughs> to actually succeed in life by telling them that they need to you know, compete at the very highest levels that they might not be quite ready for. Um, you know, that's why we're in the trouble that we're in today. Um, and, uh, the Supreme Court can, and I think we've got a good shot, the Supreme Court's going to come down hard uh, on race preferential admissions. That won't do us a step of good if we cannot deal with some of these structural issues, like the accreditation system. Accreditors are still going to say, yeah, I know the Supreme Court said you can't discriminate, but we want you to have a, a, a racially diverse class anyway, and we don't care if the only way to do that um, it is through discrimination. You know, we're not insisting on that. You can't tell us we can insist on it. Uh, Congress or, or the executive branch, the national level is going to have to stay, the creditors have to stay out of this issue. That this is not their issue. Uh, right now here at the University of San Diego, we are desperately, desperately um, trying to increase the number of, of Latino students because if we do, and always remember this, there's usually a pot of money somewhere and people are really enthusiastic it's because there's a pot of money somewhere. Hundreds of millions of dollars are given to colleges and universities that have at least 25% Hispanic students. Uh, and that is, I think, blatantly unconstitutional. Um, but it's really hard to challenge it. Uh, Dan Warnock, who's here in the audience somewhere, is trying to come up with a way to do that. But an alternative to get Congress to say, hey, you know, we looked at it. You're right. This is unconstitutional. And we never should have started this. Um, all of these things have to be done, and they all have to be done at the same time. Um, one strategic move followed by another one, move it here, move it there, write a book over here that exposes that, try to get this law changed over here. All got to be done at the same time. And I hate to say that, but like, we're the ones who are going to have to do it, you know, so come on. <laughs> California, we have over 900 school districts, so it becomes a question of context that some districts are more successful, as Chris is, and Paso Robles, uh, some are more uh, problematic, like the one that I'm in, Power Unified School District. Some are off the charts, like the LA and the San Diego Unified School District. So uh, there are different applications of how change might take place in those districts if we're working at the district level. The other question thing I would point out is a question of trust. 
when my wife and I moved up to uh, Poway for the better schools, there was a trust that the teachers would be teaching the subject matter. <laughs> it would be teachers that we expected would be do well with our, our girls there. Now there's a question of distrust. So uh, I think there's that, that, that sense of sentiment uh, in our relationship uh, within the community to our school districts that should be recognized as well. And now that is it's great being broken in some districts, but in other districts probably still working just fine. Like Paul said, just a couple of comments. The, uh, one of the reasons we were successful with getting our resolution passed to ban critical race theory is because our superintendent learned what critical race theory is. Uh, he attended one of the lectures uh, I gave at the time. I uh, believe we, we'd already just passed the resolution. He had hoped to have something wishy-washy, but he got a, a tough resolution. Then he attended a, one of my lectures there about a week later, and his uh, attitude was basically, holy crap. <laughs> I mean, he was shocked, and now he is, he is firmly behind the uh, resolution. We have pulled a couple of items of educational materials that came to our attention before they got to the students, but they were, some of it was material that had come down from the junior college to uh, use in the AP course, and that stuff has been yanked. He's, and the teachers are aware that he's enforcing this. They're aware that I sometimes go in audit classes, including the ethics studies course, and uh, they, when they see that management is behind the resolution, it's not just the school board, but your administration is behind there, and they're going to put some teeth in it, that works. Okay. I feel this battle against critical race here. It reminds me of Winston Churchill. You know, we will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them. On the we will fight them in the air. You got to. We are in a. We are in an ideological war. I mean, this is this is this is the equivalent of ideological war. And these people who are on the other side, they will resort to violence. Well, you got to see some of the stuff that happens at school board meetings, and it's not, uh, you know, Trump supporters. So when you, when you get in there and you start challenging uh, some of the, the these holy cows, uh, you, can, you can get some really interesting reactions from people in the audience, and, uh, and in emails and stuff like that. But you've got to, you've got to. Uh, Realize the seriousness of the challenge. You've got to be up for the fight because it is a fight, and you've got to realize that uh, you're going to make enemies. You're going to lose friendships. It's it's it gets if you take it serious, it it, it uh, has its consequences. But I think it is absolutely essential if we're going to keep this country from flying apart in various directions along racial lines. One more thing to add, just to emphasize the notion of, of, of there are more people on our side than you realize. You know, in the yes. last few weeks, I have had two uh, faculty members, university <coughs> faculty members, who have, you know, said, you know, gosh, I have kids, you know, I can't, I can't fight this. But that doesn't mean that they're not on our side. I mean, I'd like, I'd like those people to be less cowardly. Uh, but they, they really do have kids, and they really are scared. Uh, but you know. Once we start making headway, uh, it's going to be a lot easier to get them, on, you know, to get them to be actively on our side. Um, and though, yes, we have to fight them in the air, we have to fight them on the beaches. But like any one of us, doesn't have to be at all these places at the same time. <laughs> so, like, you know, I, I'm a lawyer. I have legal skills. I'm more likely to, to do things that that um, are are related to law. I'm on the civil rights commission. That gives me a perch. Uh, but like somebody who's on the school board, you know, fighting at the local level at these, on these school boards is hugely important. We won't win unless we win there. Uh, but uh, alas, we have to win everywhere. And we will. We will. Uh, I can add uh, one other comment. Is when we move from strategy to tactics, uh, the question about the involvement of our students in the uh, fight as well is how, how do we feel about that. Uh, I understand in some classrooms that the students are now expected to leave their cell phones at the front door so that they can't take pictures of what the teachers are teaching or are showing. Uh, so what do we do about that? Is it just simply the parents and the community or uh, we involve the students by looking at their homework, the syllabus, 
uh, kind of a low-level thing or do a, a more uh, aggressive engagement with what is being taught. Chris, you will have the answer. Yeah, the, the, uh, first of all, the students should not be uh, having their iPhones out in class. Uh, uh, one of the things that the previous panel, one of the magic words we heard was discipline. And I found that after going in auditing classes, you see the kids with the little ear buddies thing in there, and it's hooked up, of course, to their, uh, their Bluetooth things hooked up to their iPhone, and they're listening to some sort of music or whatever it is they're listening to. And the teachers will say, well, this student needs a little bit of comfort and solace. I'm like, I have all sorts of excuses, because the teachers are gutless <laughs> and enforcing the little things. Well, finally, I convinced our superintendent it's not going to be a can enforce, it's going to be a must enforce along the broken windows policy. We have been doing that since the start of the year. The iPhones all get turned in or put in the, actually they've got little uh, like plastic things hanging at the door and then they, each iPhone goes in a separate slot and the kids uh, have to take pull down their hoodies so they're not hiding one of these little clickies in the ear. And uh, it's working out fine and we're getting compliments from students on this. If you have a little bit of courage to enforce sensible rules. You may catch a little bit of flack, but overall, it's going to work out just fine. If you're always worried about, oh, but somebody might feel this or that, it's no good, no good. You've got to, you've got to have the courage of your convictions and carry it through, and at times, uh, okay, so times it, it may not work, but usually, usually things, things go very well. But that's in a good school district yeah. where there's trust. Now we're talking about a different school district where there's no trust. So I understand what you're saying, but again, the context may drive the tactics that we're looking at. Yeah, it, it, I understand in the state of California, you probably know this better than I, because it's been a long time since I've practiced law, well, but uh, surreptitiously, I think, filming the uh, teachers in class is at a time in the state of California. It's like recording. Yeah, it's like recording. So uh, we do not uh, adv advise taking that action. Uh, you can make notes. You can make notes and then you go tell your parents and get your parents incensed and then the parents go and they make life miserable for the superintendent when they ask for meetings and stuff. Now that's good. But they can take a picture of this of the blackboard. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah, they can take a picture. Of the, yeah, you can take a still picture of the blackboard, but you can't take the, uh, the, 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 the filming of the, the lecture going on, you can't do that. Uh, one little thing we've had in our school, we, we got rid of the Black Lives Matter posters. On the first day of remote learning a couple of years ago, they, they were up there. A couple of parents shipped and we taught the, the teachers, you don't have free speech when you're on the clock, the students do have free speech. The BLM posters came down within 24 hours. Okay, our ethnic studies, Teacher, he has a poster now that says Black History Matters. Well, okay, well, uh, so we accept that. That's okay. Okay, we'll go along with that. But uh, uh, there's there's a bit of a game you play, and if you take it, you try to have a little bit of fun even playing the game. I mean, come on, this this stuff it's so serious. You got to have a little bit of fun with it. Oh, so uh, uh, humor at times helps in uh, in board meetings. Throw, throw out a little little gag or something like that, I'll win some Churchill comments, whatever. Uh, it, it, things seem, it helps, it helps. You get them at the cultural level, the legal level, everywhere. Uh, let's open the floor for Q&A. Um, the large extent it's a moral issue. I think we forget that it's a fundamentally a moral issue. We cannot treat human beings, kids, no matter what, in this way. Right, that's why I say it's the ideological conflict of our time. This is, I'm old enough to remember, really remember well, the Cold War and the Wall and all that other good type of stuff. That was a tough ideological conflict. This one, I think, is goes deeper and threatens our society more than the, the old one. I was in Europe when Yugoslavia all of a sudden blew up and populations that had been living together with each other peacefully for a couple generations all of a sudden started butchering each other just you know, a few hundred miles away from where I lived in Germany. This is, this is a conflict, this is a threat of this critical race theory if it ever gets carried to an extreme. 
And we've already seen that where we had that incident in uh, Dallas, five policemen murdered by uh, some uh, BLM supporter. Okay. It was, uh, it has real consequences. That's why we've got, we've got to recognize how serious it is. And fight. Oh, I want to commend uh, both Mr. Aaron that uh, rather than just discounting ethnic studies that you made a counter proposal that was positive and in that way and also for Dr. Nalvin the two, um, two uh, ways of looking at critical race theory or critical theory rather than dis discounting and I think critical race theory is a reaction to the fact that there is injustice in our society. And I think one of the most positive things that needs to be done is to present a counterproposal in, in a positive way. And to just let you know that there are people working on that, there is a book that was written recently by a man named Thomas Cromwell. It's called Triumph of Good, Cain, Abel, and the Victory of, and the End of Marxism. There's also a, a place called the Settlement Project, which has a website that's working on presenting a counterproposal to critical race theory, which I think is a very important thing because we, we have to have a response that shows that we are concerned about injustice. We know that the things that critical race theory are attacking about our society are there. And unless we have a way to show that there is a way to end these things and bring some settlement between these differences will just continue to go on and on. So and the, I just uh, wanted to recommend the, that. Yeah, the aspect of ethnic studies that you mentioned, that I'm so glad you brought that up. Ethnic studies, we're in a debate with the political left, the CRT crowd and so on. And as, a, as in a boxing match, there are rope dope tactics. If they get you down the line, I am dead set against all ethnic studies courses. You are falling into the rope dope trap. You have to differentiate, you have to stay calm, rational, look at the details. It's the same thing with SEL or DEI. Those are just phrases, empty words, until you fill them with meaning. But they're sort of banners, flags in, in the battle. And, and if you get fooled, into just charging wildly out there, just like in a battle, you're going to get your clock cleaned. So, so uh, uh, you know, be aware, be informed. Nothing beats being informed about the subjects you're talking about. I would like to add that Thomas Sowell's book, Ethnic America, um, I think is one of the most yeah. interesting books about, about ethnicity in America uh, that you could ever run across. It makes yeah. interesting comparisons between different ethnic groups and their history in America, uh, and I recommend it to anyone um, who's interested in putting together uh, an ethnic studies course. Matt Mars? Oh, a question for the board here. Critical race theory and critical social justice thrive off sentiment, um, not logic. Uh, when you, you mentioned you were able to ban CRT from our, from our schools, but I can imagine the kind of storm that would be stirred up if you tried to take out like nonsense like the 1619 Project and um, uh, and cast. How, how did you, like, what kind of pushback did you get when the ban was successful? And how, how did you how did you work past the, um, the 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 sentiment trap, the guilt trips? The, how, how do you deal with that? Well, the the guilt tripping. I didn't feel a bit guilty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it actually doesn't work with me. Uh, so I, it doesn't work for me. Uh, we had our superintendent got on board, and we simply. You, you show a little bit of backbone. As far as the 1619 project, that wasn't in our schools anyway. So, uh, though we made sure that one of the little things we ticked off on our list of prohibitions, it wasn't going to get in there. Uh, I should, we had a little caveat on CRT. We do allow CRT to be taught if it, a critical view is taken of CRT. In other words, if you describe how much garbage it is. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say, Chris, you are strictly following uh, board policy 16144 on controversial concepts. If you want to introduce something that's controversial, that's contested, introduce the counterbalancing perspective. Right, that's right. You can do that, but to teach it, CRT is gospel, no way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add a point on that. Uh, I was interested in teaching about uh, political jihad. 
And so I used uh, Osama bin Laden uh, fatwa against the uh, big Satan, the United States, and the little Satan, uh, Israel. And uh, what I want to do is have a debate in the class about uh, those who are for it and those who are against it. What I found is that the prevailing sentiment of students, and this is a community college, and students were a little bit older, is that they were critical of the United States. And so, um, for every party platform that's critical of the United States, which we know which party that is, it sounded very familiar to them. And so it was really very difficult to engage that argument until I discovered that there was a counter fatwa. Uh, when the Madrid uh, train station was bombed in 2005, the uh, Council, of, uh, Islamic Council of uh, Spain issued a fatwa against Osama bin Laden, saying that he was not a true Muslim, because Muslims do not do that kind of violence against it. Innocent. Yes. So then I was able to have a debate of two different fatwas against each other as a way of looking at uh, political ideology and within a religious context uh, in discussing religion. So it's a very uh, controversial you know, subject, but you could do it if you kind of can create a situation which the students take away from that that there are different positions, different understandings, and different cultures. And coming from an anthropologist, I'm looking at society through a cross-cultural lens, and not just through the ethnocentric lens that we have of racism. We are just obsessed with racism. If you look at we versus them, you come away in a worldwide human history of caste, uh, religion, um, tribalism, uh, you have it. Those are all the different uh, ways in which we uh, are divided. Uh, so I think that's more important to get back to, to understand that framework to become human again rather than get caught up just because of race. We get stuck on race where, where there's no way of getting beyond that particular problem. Last question. Um, Bill? So I'd like to reopen something that Gail brought up, and this is a coward expression. And I think it's an important thing that maybe the panel could explore. Perhaps the moderator had some ideas on it. And the reason is this. So back in the math wars of the mid to late 1990s, we had parents who were scared to do things because their child might be mistreated by a teacher, or maybe they wouldn't get a college recommendation that they might have had, and so forth. And Ed and I used to say, look, Actually, if you're forthright and are leading on this, the teachers will be kind of startled and they won't do something to your child for fear of them getting into trouble for arbitrarily or badly treating your child. And uh, I think Zeb and I both had our children, you know, go through normally and they weren't adversely affected by our very prominent activity. The problem is that CRT is kind of different because instead of just saying, oh, you're not agreeing with the prevailing teaching pedagogic fad, you're a racist, you see? And that's a much harder thing. That's yeah, a person who is cowardly in the face of that is a lot more understandable. And I, I would like to hear some ideas of how to, I know we're running out of time, but the point is, this is actually a serious problem for success of our movement, mm -hmm. that we need to figure out how to overcome this problem, or make, maybe we can't overcome it, but we can make some progress or have some strategic insights about how to overcome the, the bad news is that it's not going to be easy to solve that problem, that that problem has been with us as long as humankind has, has, has been around. People are afraid to challenge the, the, the powers that be. But there's a couple of things that sometimes might help at the margins here. Um, and that is many people don't realize that if they make a complaint, they file a, what's called a charge under Title VII, uh, that you are legally protected from retaliation. So you're actually in a stronger position. Uh, if you've made a, 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 you know, filed a charge with the EEOC or filed a Title VI 
um, complaint with the Department of Education. Um, it may not be a perfect protection, um, but it's not, it's not worth nothing to be able to say that it's illegal to treat, um, to treat me differently because I've made that complaint. It's actually illegal and that would form the basis for yet another Title VII complaint. And sometimes if people know that, it might make them feel a little bit better um, and feel like, you know, they, they, they might be willing to do something they wouldn't otherwise be willing to do. I mean, it causes some people to file utterly frivolous uh, charges. I mean, that's just a fact. Um, so we might as well use it when, when there's actually a problem, where there really is a violation of Title VII or Title VI. Remember to tell people that they are protected under the law. Yeah, and I think the moral bottom line is really whether you are more com uh, commit committed to uh, an ideology or a set of ideas, a political <coughs> philosophy per se, than to the pursuit of truth, because ultimately the truth will set you free. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not on a panel, but if I can add a couple of words. One of the things that parents don't realize often is that as long as they keep it quiet, the teachers and the administrators have the upper hand. The moment you don't go about, oh, I'm against CRT, I'm racist. No, my teacher harmed my children because I spoke out. That's the problem. And that's what you want to go to your local newspaper, is often willing to write it up because there is a revenge against my children. That's not acceptable, whatever I think as a parent. Parents have to understand it, and the newspapers love it, and the teachers and the system hate it if the names show up. Oh, there is a revenge, there is a retaliation. Yeah. Know the process and go to the press immediately, the local press. The big press will not care about it, but there's always local press. Teachers and systems, uh, school systems hate it, and your child will be protected because of that, not because you spoke out. Right, sunshine is the best dis disinfectant. So uh, we'll have to conclude this panel. I wish we could carry on the conversation. Before.